All right, folks, here we are. We're in chapter 13 of the book To Be As God, a uh, modern thought from the Marquis de Sade forward, so uh, by R.J. Rushjani. So we're going to hit the record button and uh, try to record 13 and 14. Chapter 13, Non-Persons. History has seen many killers, political leaders who have murdered millions, and a variety of evildoers who have seen their fulfilment in criminal activities. To any such list we must add the philosophers whose ideas provided the impetus for human action. Ideas do have consequences, as Richard Weaver pointed out. In Genesis 11, 1-9, we are told of the builders of the Tower of Babel that they sought to create a one-world order in defiance of and without God. A united mankind, they believed, could rival God and create its own order and law. Babel failed, but the civil orders which followed defined man in terms of the state, so that to be a stateless man was to be a non-person. In his politics, Aristotle defined the accepted wisdom of the ancient world. He held that, quote, The state is a creation of nature, and that man is by nature a political animal. End quote. In fact, said Aristotle, quote, Man is more of a political animal than bees or any other gregarious animals. End quote. The state is, quote, Prior to the family and the individual, End quote. This is a basic premise for Aristotle. He wrote, quote, The proof that the state is a creature of nature and prior to the individual is that the individual, when isolated, is not self-sufficing, and therefore he is like a part in relation to the whole. But he who is unable to live in society, or who has no needs because he is sufficient for himself, must be either a beast or a god. He is no part of the state. A social instinct is implanted in all men by nature, and yet he who first founded the state was the greatest of benefactors. For man, when perfected, is the best of animals, but when separated from law and justice, he is the worst of all, since armed injustice is the more dangerous, and he is equipped at birth with arms meant to be used by intelligence and virtue, which he may use for the worst ends. Wherefore, if he have not virtue, he is the most unholy and the most savage of animals, and the most full of lust and gluttony. But justice is the bond of men and states, for the administration of justice, which is the determination of what is just, is a principle of order in political society. End quote. Now, in his Ethics, Aristotle defines injustice as, quote, all that is contrary to the law, end quote. Thus, for Aristotle, the state defines man and the state defines justice. Law is created by the state, and status law is justice. What this meant was that the stateless man was a non-person. The practical consequence we see in the Hittite laws for example, incest was a capital crime. For a man to cohabit with his wife's sister or mother meant death if they were free women. If, however, a man and if, however, a man engaged with sex with a slave girl and her mother, or if a father and son or some. Or if a father and son or some free men did so, there was no offence and no punishment. The same act meant incest and death where a free woman was involved, and yet meant nothing with slave women because they were non-persons. This was common to many cultures. In Rome, according to Florence Dupont, sexual offences had nothing to do with age or gender, and... had nothing to do with age or gender, and, quote, 
everything to do with legal status. End quote. Was the child an adult, a slave, and therefore a non person or a free person? Citizenship defined people. Quote, Romans were social beings. They did not consider themselves human unless they belonged to some form of society. In fact, Dupont states, quote, Citizens alone were possessed of souls. Children, slaves and women were soulless bodies. Their father, master or husband provided their animus. End quote. In Rome's days of quote-unquote virtue, sex outside marriage with a freeborn woman was forbidden. With slaves, non-persons, nothing was prohibited and modern bans against perversions and insects did not apply to sex with Roman slaves. The slave owner, as a free citizen, could copulate with his slaves, including those who were genetically his sons and daughters, and his sons did the same. The slaves were legally non-persons, and therefore the act did not count. The only moral consideration exercised by the free man was this. Was he too prone to surrender to his instincts? What he did was not the important fact, but the degree of his enslavement to, quote, his brutish instincts, end quote. Sex with slave children was commonplace. It apparently also took place with free children, but efforts were made to prevent this. But slaves, young and old, being non-persons, were casually used. A master could be fond of his slaves, but they were still non-persons before the law, and, quote, Citizens alone possessed a soul. End quote. The early church came into the Roman world with a radically different faith. In terms of scripture, it held that man is created in the image of God. Genesis 1, 26 to 28. In knowledge, righteousness, or justice, holiness, and dominion. Genesis 1, 27 and 28. Colossians 3, 10. Ephesians 4, 24. Paul on Mars Hill declared, quote, God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, neither is worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things, and hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation that they should seek the Lord, if haply they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as certain also of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone graven by art and man's device. And the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent, because he hath appointed a day in which the he will judge. He hath appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, wherefore he hath given assurance unto all men, in that he hath raised him from the dead. Acts 17 24 to 31. It is helpful in understanding this text to realize that these key facts governed the Greeks to whom Paul spoke. First, Greek thought required a first cause, God, because it rejected an infinite regress. They needed God as a limiting concept, an idea rather than the sovereign being. Second, the perfect God of Greek philosophy could not involve himself with creating or creation. He had to be too far above such activity to be even remotely involved. Aristotle thus formulated the theory of the eternity of the world. Third, this answer was necessary because, quote, for a Hellenistic Greek, no god could touch matter and still remain god, end quote. The Christian doctrine of the incarnation was thus intensely offensive to the Greeks. With this in mind, Paul's carefully chosen words become more understandable. It was the inscription, To the unknown God, that led to Paul's words. First, 
Paul declares that God is the creator. The universe had a beginning in God's creative act. He is both creator and the ultimate being who is beyond all human depiction. Having created man and being beyond man, he can neither be depicted by man's arts nor worshipped in man's way. Second, God is the creator of all mankind, of one blood, so that man is not defined by the state, but by God, whose predestination determines the limits of men and nations. Third, men are to worship God who is close at hand, transcendent yet omnipresent and imminent. We are God's creation, and he is our total environment. Quote, For in him we live and move and have our being. End quote. Instead of being an object of knowledge, he is the only true ground of all knowledge. This means that we must rethink all our ways of knowing. Fourth, having sent his Son, God is no longer indulgent of men's folly and ignorance. There will be, at the end of history, a day of accounting for all, a judgment day. The judge will be God the Son, Jesus Christ, whom God the Father resurrected from the dead. The implication of all this is that the state does not define man. Stateless persons are not non-persons. God is the definer because he is the creator. But modern man agrees with ancient man. He sees with Aristotle the state as the definer of persons and non-persons. This is because modern man first insists on seeing the state as the vessel of salvation. The state is seen as the problem solver and the benefactor. The state makes the laws, and the laws define man. At the same time, the flight from Christian morality has meant the rise of pornography. The people in pornographic writings and films, magazines, etc. are non-persons. They exist to provide fuel for the pornographic imagination. Darwinism has reduced man to a higher ape, and in spite of all efforts to the contrary, the logical result has been the dehumanization of man. For some, the environment as an entity to be worshipped and preserved has taken priority over humanity. Education has furthered the depersonalization of men by stressing the environment unduly and by striking at morality as God's law prescribes it. The churches, by their antinomianism, have replaced God's law with the state's law, have foolishly allowed the state to be the defining power. In one state in the 1970s, I learned of a number of, quote, evangelical, end quote, churches, varying between 60 and 100 in their meetings, who were agreeable to state controls and laws, whether of Christian schools, of questions of abortion and homosexuality, and soon, as long as they were free to proclaim John 3.16. But how long could the meaning of that text stand before a state claiming the prerogative of God in lawmaking? The modern term for the major part of the peoples of the earth is the masses. Marxists have not been alone in using this term. This is one of the many aspects of depersonalization. The early church rescued abandoned babies and reared them as Christians. They were technically and legally non-persons and hence slaves, but in the Christian community they were brothers and sisters in Christ. Soon it became... Some became in time pastors and bishops. The medieval era steadily eliminated slavery and the status of non-persons, but Renaissance humanism, with its revival of Greco-Roman ideas, brought back slavery, and the Enlightenment furthered it. Modern statism and one-worldism seek to further the status redefinition of man and the de-Christianization of society. This process is well on its way. The prelude to it was a massive saturation of education with classical culture. It is an ironic fact that men concentrated on Plato's philosopher kings rather than the majority of the people in Plato's Republic. 
In our urban streets, gangs of young killers see nothing wrong in killing others, seen as non-persons, while enraged at harm done to one of their own gang members. In all non-Christian thinking, others are depersonalized. For the faithful in Christ, the Great Commission requires their discipling into Christ's community, kingdom and life. Matthew 28, 18-20 The news is full of reports and rumours of war, of murders and of child molestation. It is commonplace for people to be treated as non-persons. Ideas do have consequences. All right, thanks for tagging along in the booth of truth. It was groovy. And just going to take a sip, pause the camera. And then crack on. Cracking. Alrighty. Let's crack on, shall we? Chapter 14. Being and self-definition. The concept of a... The concept of being has a curious history and now a curious neglect, both by philosophy and theology. From the Greeks to the existentialists and on, it has been variously defined. The early Greek philosophers defined it in contrast to change or becoming. True being is changeless and eternal, whereas becoming is changeable, illusory and to some extent unreal. Aristotle held that being is eternal in itself, but its manifestations are in change. The Milesians had held that being is a cosmic substance, timeless, spaceless, and unden... wasn't expecting that word. Timeless, spaceless, and undifferentiated. Nothing else has real existence. This could mean that man's life is lived in non-being. Aristotle resolved this dilemma by holding that, while material atoms are in and basic to the world around us, their essence is the unfolding, changing world around us. The material world is more than illusion, it is being in process. True being is thus an unfolding essence, the reality is in phenomena. The two are linked together. Only when the phenomena are fully and totally developed will the true being, the essence, be known. Thus, all knowledge until then is tentative. Form is continually becoming matter, and the answer awaits the possible completion of this process. All being is one continuous being, although many things in process have a thinness of being. God is pure form, and matter is pure possibility. Matter, like God, has always existed. How the two can interwork, Aristotle could not explain. This perspective has, with variations, dominated philosophy in the Western tradition. Biblical Christianity has a very different perspective. Instead of one being, we have the uncreated being of God, and then the created being of the entire world of creation. There can be no confusion between uncreated and created being. The Council of Chalcedon, 451 AD, insisted on the perfect union without confusion of the two natures of Christ. Too many thinkers, however, preferred the Greek answer and the concept of the great chain of being became popular, especially with the Enlightenment. Everything participated in this theory in the being of God but the lower on the scale of creation, the thinner the participation in being. All being in this concept is God-being. But most things, as I heard in a student in my youth lightly describe it, are lower in their, quote, God stuff, end quote. For Jean-Paul Sartre, the dualism of appearance and essence was illusory. The whole of being and nothingness was a confused effort to define being in terms of the Kantian existentialist framework. 
The language of philosophy, its terminology and assumptions, Sartre dismissed as no longer valid. Since the existentialist movement is a lone wheel, and since religious, social and emotional data exist only in our consciousness for Sartre, the logic of his position meant that being is existential man, who is then his own god. In the process, however, all meaning was annihilated, so that no meaning remains, and to be is nothingness. The death of God becomes the death of meaning and of God. The death of God school of thought is... The death of God school of thought similarly found itself negating itself. Quote, For Altizer, modern culture and so many contemporary man... Sorry. Modern culture and so any contemporary man who expresses its mood finds a transcendent God both unreal and repressive, a threat to our human creativity, authenticity and freedom. Only, said he, if we dare to declare this transcendent God dead and cease to depend on him, can we appropriate the divine that is imminent in us in the living word that always changes its forms? End quote. This also leaves man as a self-definer in a world without meaning. The, quote, living word, end quote, becomes whatever meaning it has at the will of the reader, so that meaning becomes subjective, ephemeral, and a creature of the moment. In Acts 17.28, St. Paul spoke of God as he in whom, quote, we live and move and have our being, end quote. Many now deny this and replace God with time. But time from old has been as much under attack as perhaps God. Parmenides, born 515 BC of the Eleatic school, identified being as all that fills space. It is also timeless and change in becoming are irrational illusions. Heraclitus, circa 536 to 470 BC of Ephesus, denied permanence and held that change is universal. He held, quote, all things are one, end quote. For Parmenides, quote, being has no coming into being and no destruction, end quote. Without the triune God of Scripture, man has always had intellectual as well as moral problems, and the two have been interconnected. Where meaning is questioned, morality is questioned or denied, or God is denied, all meaning soon disappears and philosophy becomes scepticism and cynicism. Wittgenstein's moral life was simply an expression of his philosophy. To raise questions about being is to question life. Now, all this is essentially related to our modern world. When men deny the being who created all things, the triune God, they deny their own being. To assume that by million... To assume, assume, assume. To assume that by billions of amazing miracles something evolved out of absolute nothingness is to abandon not only morality but rationality for immoralism and madness. As a student, I found in a discussion with a radically cynical and immoral student that he was emphatic in his denial of God and meaning. He saw man only as an overdeveloped form of protoplasm and denied any and all responsibility to his parents and to the young woman he cynically used. By this means, he prevented any and all considerations of morality and responsibility. He was insistent that man is no more than a copulating animal. While insistent on getting his due in money from his parents and part-time work, he denied the validity of any obligation, courtesy or code of honour. Since then, what he represented has become commonplace. The Christian view of being affirms the uncreated and eternal being of the triune God and the created being of man and all things else. 
The denial of this means a denial of law and power from above and its quest from below. Being becomes progressively an unacceptable category of thought because it has reference to meaning and meaning is rejected together with God. The rejection of meaning becomes a passion. In the late 1970s, outside a chapel in Westwood, Los Angeles, where I then preached weekly, a student from the university came on the scene as the worshippers after the service were visiting. He started confronting people with obscenities and pornographic remarks about Christianity. The only reality he insisted was copulation, and Christians had too many hang-ups to enjoy it. There was no other meaning for him. This is not surprising. Meaning has become a complicated thing in modern philosophy whose subject is often simply language and its essential non-meaning. Max Black, in the Dictionary of Philosophy, called it a... I do it right! Max Black, in the Dictionary of Philosophy, called it, quote, a highly ambiguous term, end quote. The denial of God means at the least questioning both being and meaning. Dostoevsky held that if there is no God, then everything is permitted. In his novel The Possessed, Dostoevsky depicts Kirillov as a man determined to kill God. But this requires a strange conclusion. Quote, I can't understand how an atheist could know that there is no God and not kill himself on the spot. To recognise that there is no God and not to recognise at the same instant that one is God oneself is an absurdity, else one would certainly kill oneself. If you recognise it's your sovereign, and then you won't kill yourself but will live in the greatest glory, but one, the first, must kill himself, or else who will begin and prove it? Now, I am the only a God. What is this? I don't understand it. Now, I am only a God against my will, and I am unhappy because I am bound to assert my will. All are unhappy because all are afraid, and man is so poor because he has been afraid to assert his will in the highest point, and has shown his self-will only in little things like a schoolboy. I am awfully unhappy, for I am awfully afraid. Terror is the curse of man. But I will assert my will. I am bound to believe that I don't believe. I will begin and will make an end of it and open the door and will save. That's the only thing that will save mankind and will recreate the next generation physically. For with his present physical nature... Man can't get on without his former God, I believe. For three years I've been seeking for the attribute of my Godhead, and I've found it. The attribute of my Godhead is self-will. That's all I can do to prove in the highest point my independence and my new terrible freedom. For it is very terrible. I am killing myself to prove my independence and my new terrible freedom. End quote. This was an early and radical statement of existentialism set against the background of Russian orthodoxy. Kirillov first asserts the necessity for the death of God. The assertion of God's non-existence is, with Kirillov, the required step for the, quote, liberation, end quote, of men. But, second, if God is dead, then man is God, and all things are then permitted. This, however, is a fearful conclusion for a generation reared to believe in God and to keep God's law. The man taking this step moves into total freedom, quote, the greatest glory, end quote, but in the process of becoming his own God, this man carries with him the baggage of the old God. He is full of fear and terror, of self-condemnation, because he is haunted by the moral law of the old God. By killing himself, the leader Kirillov places his... By killing himself, the leader Kirillov places himself beyond the rule or law of the old god. 
Third, to be one's own god is a fearful burden for Kirillov because one is then bound to assert his self-will. The Christian god gave a peace and security by barring certain acts of man's will as evil, but as one's own god, when man sees something he desires, why should he not take it? Why should he not kill, steal, rape and lie at will? Restraint is then a denial of one's own divinity. Fourth, the attributes of man's newfound godhood. Godhead. This is heavy stuff. Heavy stuff. Wah. Okay, I just... Uh, try again. Nope, nope. No, 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 no. Whew, how you doing there, folks? How you doing? All right, you doing all right? Yeah, what's happening, eh? Fourth, the attributes of man's newfound godhead is self-will. How can be? How can be one? You no god. Self-will. How can one be a god and deny that? Kirillov committed suicide as a pilot to mankind to tell them to despise life itself if it keeps him in bondage to the old god and his law. But Kirillov came out of the context of a church-oriented culture. When he denied the being of God, he in practice affirmed it. Yotor Stevanovich, while wrongly stating that Kirillov would not commit suicide, rightly observed, quote, the nuisance of it is that he believes in God like any priest. End quote. The true unbelievers were living beyond God. They were the possessed, the true devils, because for them the only course in their godless world was the evil act. They practiced evil as a witness to their freedom and the non being of God and man. Evil is today endemic in the modern world. The young commit meaningless acts of violence and murder simply to act, to express themselves, and living for them means doing evil. Their self-definition is not in terms of any traditional doctrine of evil, it is in terms of evil, of killing, fornicating mindlessly, and in contempt for all that is good. I once visited Bella I once visited a university student in prison. He simply assumed the meaningless of life and being, life and being. He simply assumed the meaninglessness. He simply assumed the meaninglessness of life and being, and Darwin was his one authority. Having a deep respect for his grandmother, it took me years to speak openly of that brilliant young man's views. For him to be meant to commit evil. The ideas of the good, the true and the holy were myths to him. Man could only know himself in what the church has called evil. Nothing in life had for him any reality other than self-will and evil. If any being of a transcendental source existed, it had to be from below, mindless, self-assertive and essentially chaos. This young man expressed a faith which increasingly manifests itself around the world. All right, uh, um, it might, be, might have been better to do that ending again, but I'm not going to do it. I just don't have enough time in the day. So thanks for tuning in. If you want to support this work, you can send me a message. Uh, leave a comment, do what you do. Um, if you want to support it financially, you can do so by going to nathanteacher.com and you can make a one-off donation or, or uh, monthly, whatever. Uh, leave me a little note. All right, God bless and hope to see you very soon.